Uh, and uh, like uh, for, uh, it so happens that uh, in our clinical practice, in a hurry to convince our patients, we often make a treatment plan forgetting the basic pro uh, prosthetic part. And uh, for an implant to be successful, it's very necessary that the basic principles of prosthodontics are planned beforehand, before you start placing an implant. So Dr. Shahul uh, Hamid, who's a very eloquent and a dynamic speaker, he's going to take us through this presentation. Dr. Shahul is a very uh, eminent uh, prosthodontist and implantologist who's been working in Bangalore since eight to 10 years. He's a fellow of uh, ICUI. He's a fellow and diplomate of uh, Osseo, uh, Brainmark Osseo Integration Center. He's been an assistant, he's, a, he's been a former assistant professor uh, in uh, the Department of Prosthodontics in Vaidehi. And um, welcome, Dr. Shahul. And uh, on the panel, we also have Dr. Fahad Ansari, who's an eminent prosthodontist. He's working in the holy city of Makkah, Saudi Arabia. To his credit, he has, um, he has uh, written, uh, um, he has his uh, original research articles on implant abutments, and for which he has won the best scientific paper award at the National PG uh, Convention and Conference. He has also been a student contributor for uh, Philip's new Asia edition textbook of dental materials. I welcome you both doctors, and it's a great pleasure to have you on board. Uh, Dr. Shahul, uh, without making, uh, without taking much time, you can please start your much-awaited presentation for today. Thank you, Dr. Usman. Uh, is my screen uh, visible to everyone? Yes, Dr. Shahul. Can you, can everyone hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you clearly. So thank you very much, Dr. Usma. And I welcome you all for today's uh, uh, presentation. Assalamu alaikum to everyone. And uh, having said that, as Dr. has already introduced us, so I will not waste much time in uh, um, introducing myself or introducing much of the topic. The topic is basically prosthetic word flow in restoring teeth, which is by using dental implants as a treatment modality for us. See, um, whenever we talk about dental implants, the first thing that comes to our mind at this juncture is because a lot of uh, research work and a lot of work is happening at the uh, uh, full mouth reconstruction level. So always dental implants are linked towards full mouth reconstruction, uh, but they, uh, but uh, that's not a scenario we see on a daily basis. Of course, a few may see that, but uh, most of the general practitioners and uh, implantologists on a daily basis for their bread and butter would be basically seeing dentitions of these type where we have partially edentulous uh, conditions for the patient where we can see that teeth can be missing at any place for any reason. It can be periodontal reason. It can be a um, uh, reason because of uh, deep carious activity, uh, deep carious lesions, finally leading to the loss of the tooth or probably on the verge of losing the tooth because of that. Uh, but whatever uh, said and done, a dentition which is not desirable is what we see on a daily basis. And we are always trying to replace them, reconstruct those missing teeth uh, so that uh, we are able to give back the form and function to a patient. So having said that, our modalities of treatment, uh, whatever our modalities of treatment may be, what, are we, what basically we are trying to do is that we are trying to uh, bring about uh, functionality back and in turn also uh, help in uh, providing better aesthetics or replacing the aesthetics which were naturally present. And third is, of course, phonetics also plays an important role, especially when we are trying to replace the uh, aesthetic zone, a region of the front teeth. But um, with uh, having said that, what are our options of treatment uh, uh, which we can provide to our patients? Most of the times, if uh, the type of treatments which we are trying to provide are basically removable partial dentures, 
which can be also cast partial dentures. Most commonly nowadays, uh, a lot popular is the flexible dentures or the monomer free dentures are quite used. Um, the second option would be to give fixed restorations when the patients, uh, uh, for the patients. And when you're talking about fixed restorations, most of the time it is uh, uh, tooth supported fixed restorations. But there are many conditions where we cannot use tooth supported fixed restorations because they don't follow the biomechanical principles or the abutments are really not in that healthy condition to be taken in. At, that is the time when we're looking for, for implants, but I completely change my, uh, I beg to differ from this concept. We should be looking forward for dental implants as the first line of treatment uh, rather than as the last line of treatment. And uh, when we talk about why is, why do we have to uh, say that uh, um, implants should be the first line of treatment rather than FPTs and RPD? Of course, we want to give the best for our patients um, in terms of prosthetic rehabilitation. And when we talk about prosthetic rehabilitation, my fellow prosthodontists will definitely, uh, uh, my fellow dentists would definitely agree that most we are basically talking about the prosthetic retention, the stability or the support, because that's the most important thing. Uh, in fact, even from the, uh, age, uh, from the perspective of students, a student from the day one of our uh, undergraduate program, the first thing that's taught to it is retention, stability, support, the definitions of this. So yes, on a um, clinical note, this is first thing which we require that our, uh, that our process should be retentive, should be stable, should have a proper support system, other than aesthetics and the preservation of the uh, adjacent hard and soft tissues. So if you see a, a removable partial denture and implant, of course, the implant is very good when it comes to tension, stability, support. From the aesthetic purpose, of course, the removable partial dentures to an extent are much more aesthetic because they're not only replacing the naturally lost teeth, but also the flanges are able to replace the lost soft tissues. Uh, so they look a little more aesthetically uh, pleasing as compared to um, your uh, implants because when you talk about FPDs and implants, if your soft tissue is lost, it's very difficult to regain them back. And even if you're regaining back with the help of ceramics, you don't have that much amount of variety of shade, shades and ceramics to mimic the soft tissues as compared to removable partial dentures. But the where the, where the implants take the precedence over almost everything is the preservation of the adjacent hard and soft tissues. Uh, removable partials and fixed partial dentures on tooth supported, the uh, preservation of the bone and the preservation of the abutment teeth, adjacent hard and soft, is not there as compared to what's in the implant. So if we say in total, in general, implant treatment is the best modality of uh, uh, treatment uh, when it comes to uh, prosthetically rehabilitating teeth. Let us consider a scenario where a patient has lost a tooth, a front uh, central incisor. So what we try to do is we try to uh, replace the, uh, uh, the tooth with the help of two adjacent teeth here by, replacing, uh, by preparing them and giving a beautiful FPT for the patient. Patient feels happy because the, uh, the time consumed to do this prosthetic work is very less. Uh, and aesthetically also we are able to do a good job. Everything looks good for the initial in terms of cost factors also is cheaper than doing dental implants. Uh, and it is fixed in the mouth. So patient happy, doctor happy, everyone's happy. But what happens when in uh, a few years down the lane, we see that uh, there's alveolar bone resorption. Uh, now in the pontic region, we will start seeing food lodgements. The soft tissue has uh, has uh, there is a recession over there. The abutments, if there if the uh, if it is not uh, following the biomechanical principles correctly, uh, we also start seeing recession in the abutment teeth also. Thereby, now these are the areas which are susceptible to inflammation, secondary caries, um, food lodgement, and basically at the end of the day in a few years, what we see is the now the abutment teeth are either periodontally compromised or are endodontically compromised, eventually leading to the loss of these abutment teeth. So what do we do? Okay, we, we go ahead, again, we extract another tooth and then we prepare another adjacent tooth uh, in an ideal condition, of course, we, extra, we try to save them, but if we cannot save them, we have to rest extract them and then go ahead and do another bridge, this time a four unit bridge. 
and this concept is just keeps going on and on and on there is not there is no stopping to this where does it have to stop it doesn't stop at all uh, because the only treatment we are trying to provide or modality of treatment to provide in terms of fix is trying to do an abut uh, tooth supported abutment based tooth supported bridge when we look at the, upon the patient's experience we are trying to replace these bridges every 5 to 10 years so additional we are incurring additional cost factors um you know if it, uh, when you compare them to a natural teeth we are not able to really provide that better that type of mastication uh, which which uh, natural teeth can provide these fpts cannot do that so we have some restrictions of food food trapment is there increased gum uh, recessions gum diseases and basically at the end we are sacrificing good natural teeth in order to replace the ones which are lost and the cycle just doesn't ever end till we lose all our teeth so what do we have as an alternative treatment i should not say an alternative as the best treatment modality use of implant supported or implant retaining crowns and bridges when we are trying to compare implants with uh, fpd uh, basically implants with the tooth supported fpds um you know a lot of journals a lot of articles have been published where they have where they have done a lot of analysis where is on an average and they see that uh, in 10.1 years is the max a tooth would or a bridge would survive without any problems that means failures and problems start within 10 years of any type of bridge placement whereas compared to implants which has 97% survival rate um we do see a lot of abutment teeth uh, within uh, 10 to 15 years of the, uh, the placement of the fpds which in basically in terms of implants we are not using the adjacent teeth so we are not seeing any type of issues so there is this decrease risk of adjacent tooth loss uh, so when you compare fpds and implants the implants take a precedence over fpds that's the thing sometimes we also see that uh, uh, when we have adjacent teeth which are already capped or need to be root canal treated and crowned we say that why would you want to do an implant in the dentulous areas but no implant should be the treatment of choice even if the adjacent teeth needs a crown or needs a restoration to be fixed because every tooth is an individual uh, component in our uh, oral max uh, in our uh, Uh, oral stomatogenetic system and has its important role. If you're going to splint these teeth together in order to replace the uh, missing tooth, we are basically converting these individual single units into uh, uh, individual multiple units into one single system, and thereby we are not able to give justice biomechanically for these teeth. So even in a condition where you have a missing um a single molar and you can do a bridge or if it's an old uh, long standing old bridge which you're trying to replace probably implant placement in the uh, implants uh, retained crown in the uh, in the dentulous area and two separate crowns would have much more better survival rate as compared to a repeat of a three unit bridge so when to do implants in terms of indication of implant therapy i guess the best answer would be that every partially or completely dentulous case implant should be the first option that should be thought at the time of diagnosis and treatment planning that not implant per se but an implant retained prosthesis or implant supported prosthesis uh, should be the first line of uh, treatment which we should think about uh, rather than doing partial uh, remo removal dentures or by trying to do some sort of uh, fixed up tooth related uh, uh, prosthesis um when you're trying to replace the, the teeth uh, the small chart which can, which uh, tends to show um you know how we can usually do that is if you have a missing tooth present or if you have a tooth which needs to be extracted or a tooth which has been damaged due to an injury or something if there is sufficient amount of bone definitely you go ahead and uh, place an implant and then fo followed by prosthetic rehab or if the tooth needs to be extracted we need to see whether there is bone loss or not and if there is some amount of bone loss then graft the site come back after a couple of months and then go ahead and place the implant and a, a couple of months later then go ahead and place the dental implant so whatever the condition may be whether there is a missing tooth present a uh, missing uh, wherever there is a mid, uh, edentulous space present or if a uh, area is been planned that we will go into further edentulism after you extract that area 
plan for dental implant, retain crown and bridges rather than doing any type of any alternative prosthesis. Having said that, uh, not in every condition we can place dental implants. When we're not supposed to imply or uh, contraindications are very few, but uh, recent myocardial infarctions, recent cerebrovascular accidents, valvular prosthetic surgeries, immunosupp uh, immunosuppressions, that is basically uh, in bleeding disorders, and when there's active uh, treatment for malignancies, drug abuse, psychiatric illnesses, and intravenous bisphosphonate therapies are some of the absolute contraindications. Where when I talk about recent, word recent, we're basically talking about six to eight months within the span of six to eight months, any type of medical condition. Uh, should be a contraindication, which later can become, uh, can uh, come into the concept of relative rather than absolute contraindication. Uh, but one of the most important place where, at least in, in my eight to 10 years of, of the practice where I have seen, where I wouldn't really want to do any type of implant, treatment, crown bridge or supported prosthesis would be where there's a pa poor patient compliance uh, that is basically a, uh, the patient uh, is, has a failure to keep his mouth clean or, you know, uh, uh, it is, one second, okay. uh, uh, when there's a failure to keep your mouth open, uh, which basically means that uh, if we are going to be placing a foreign body or basically a fixture in the particular bone, and if the soft tissue is highly inflamed and is periodontally compromised and the patient himself or herself is not maintaining the dentition, which is existing dentition well, then I really do not think that the patient will be able to give justice to what we are basically doing for the particular patient. Having said that, if the patient can be, along with the prosthetic treatment, if the patient can be counseled towards becoming a good compliant patient, then definitely that then the patient can be indicated for placement of dental implants in the thing. One second. Coming on to the product, uh, one, one uh, thing, I'm getting a pop-up. Uh, at every time I'm getting a pop-up, which is showing uh, uh, people who are joining the group and it's asking me to admit them. Dr. Nair? Uh, Dr. Nair please can... continue, Dr. Nair. Please, you it, continue. The pop-up is coming and asking me to admit. We will manage with it. I'm so sorry. Continue. Okay. So having said that, uh, the product is basically uh, what we are placing in our patient's mouth is an implant. And when we talk about uh, implants, we have so many companies in the market, more than a thousand companies which are providing uh, dental implants of, uh, well, I'm talking about in very specific crystal implants or endosseous implants. So, so many companies in the market which are providing different types of dental implants. All of them are titanium implants, but they have their own size, own uh, um, uh, uh, specifications and own designs and everything and every company claims through their researchers that it is the best design which they can offer uh, for better for better osteointegration integration and long-term success but having said that all of them are titanium implants and what we should keep in mind from the prosthetic perspective more than the implant because uh, when we are prosthetically rehabilitating the patient we are assuming that the implants are already osteointegrated. So what should be kept in mind from the prosthetic perspective is what is the platform we are working on for that particular implant. So in our clinical practice on a daily basis, we may place implants ourselves and then rehabilitate the uh, or uh, do prosthetic uh, loading or prosthetic phase after a couple of months, depending upon the clinical scenario. Or we may end up with getting some patients who have got the implants done elsewhere and they have reached our clinic or our setup and want the prosthetic part to be done. In uh, both the conditions, it's very important for us to know which implant systems we have used, which implants we have placed. And why do we want to know which implant systems we have used? Because it's not, it's not just that it's a, uh, it is a universal uh, cap which will be placed or a prefabricated universal abutment which is going to be fixed in and that is, com that is uh, compatible with every system on the face of the earth. No, 
every company are unique have their own unique platforms on which they particularly work so you can you know relate them to in mobiles you have an android platform you have an ios platform um in computers you have a windows platform you have uh, the mac system you have the linux system so every platform is different and every platform uh, needs to be uh, assessed before we take the next step forward towards prosthetically rehabilitating them and why am i saying that is because uh, shahul uh, sorry sorry to interrupt sorry yes. to interrupt uh, yes. there is a small window on your sharing screen which says uh, please move this window yeah can you see that yes can you move it away please please move on the shared application one second uh sorry audio members uh, so, sorry for the interruption please is it now moved uh, i just still there yeah now it's gone yeah it's gone yeah sorry for the inconvenience please continue yeah uh, so what wrong about the platform so like for example i used uh, ostem as my comp- as uh, my implant of options i also use is any based uh, internal hex system so internal hex is a is a different platform and um, a more stable with uh, internal hex concept is a different platform in nobel you have a tri channel or mickey head system you have uh, the uh, mark 1 with external hex which are no more used we have conical uh, platform so these are different platforms and you cannot interchange these uh, 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 the components of these platforms in order to successfully rehabilitate so it's very important for us to know at the beginning itself what platform we are treating and uh, 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 subsequently the components which are required for this particular system to use Uh, so coming on to the concept of implant workflow so we definitely know that basically it's uh, what we tell our patients is they see uh, in inside your bone we're going to put a fixture or an implant fixture and implant mean the same thing fixture is an european con- is a european name for the uh, us concept of uh, calling the um, the titanium screw as an implant so the second one is um, abutment which is basically a projection or the clinical uh, projection on top which is going to get fixed on the osteo integrated implant and on this particular abutment you have the uh, crown which goes and gets fit onto it so this is in basically when talking about crown and bridge uh, implant prosthetics so these are the three parts of your entire uh, system when we go ahead and do an implant system what we are trying to do is basically we are going to do a uh, implant phase 1 implant a uh, phase 1 implant surgery and after the phase 1 implant surgery we are going to go and prosthetically rehabilitate during the phase 2 and the phase 3 so phase 1 is all about basically placement of the implant which is nothing but uh, after a thorough diagnosis and treatment planning and deciding what is the size of the implant and what is the final angle or the number of implants placed and everything we are going to do a flap reflection we are going to follow a particular drill protocol and then go ahead and do a fixture insertion or the implant placement and finally put a cover screw and cover it up for a couple of months that is between 3 months uh, for 3 months for in the mandible and approximately 4 to 5 months minimum in the maxillary bone is what is the time period we wait before we go ahead with the phase 2 and the phase 3 of the prosthetic rehab but the problem that arises over here is what after we uh, successfully go ahead and do the uh implant placement and the implant becomes osteo integrated because if you actually go ahead and see uh, uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, programs or technically uh, the implant training programs most of the programs 99% of the programs are all centric towards placement of the implant so they they go into depth about uh uh, uh diagnosis treatment planning and placement of the dental implant but when it comes to the prosthetic part the amount of time spent is very less but i beg to differ this is this at the end of the day the patient is going to not see whether you have placed a perfectly good implant or a big implant or a small implant or whether the implant is osteo integrated or not the patient is not really concerned about that the patient is concerned at the end of the day the final prosthesis which we need to be um 
which has to be delivered. The process is not only has to be perfectly good, uh, um, you know, uh, mimicking the natural teeth, uh, teeth which we are trying to replace, but also should be well retained, uh, should be fixed perfectly, and should be long lasting without any maintenance problems in future or minimal maintenance problems in future. In this thing, what happens is most of the times when the implant is being done, when we come to the prosthetic portion of the placement, either our knowledge base is a little less, or we are dependent on the fourth dimension over here. See. Uh, uh, the patient, the clinic, and the clinician. They are three basic um, dimensions of the particular thing, of the particular treatment plan. The fourth dimension is basically the lab, which is going to fabricate the final processes. So we are dependent mostly on the upper, on the lab to provide us a processes. Uh, and whatever the lab will provide the processes, if we have, if we don't have really the knowledge to control that, we end up placing thinking that this is exactly right, but we don't know what are the future consequences of that. So having said that, my whole concept is, uh, my whole presentation, which is uh, which is there, is trying to simplify, at least for the from the general dentistry perspective, when we think about implant uh, retained crown and bridge as a treatment option, this is what, how you can control your outcome of the final thing by following some uh, guidelines or following some uh, tips and tricks. So having said that, when we talk about implant prosthetics, uh, most of the time we are confused or we are uh, juggling between what type of prosthesis we need to place in our patient. Whether the process is going to be just a simple FP1 prosthesis where we are just replacing the white portion of the uh, lost tooth structure, or is it that we are trying to, uh, where we have a little bit of soft tissue loss, so we are just using long, uh, uh, are called uh, ceramic teeth to replace, it's called FP2, or we are also trying to mimic the soft tissues over here, that is the gingival portion in the form of artificial pink porcelain and calling, calling it an FP3. We don't know what is going to be the final thing. Second is we also do not know whether our, pro our process is going to be a screw retained process or whether it will be a cementable process. So many questions will come because this is the part which is customized. Um, when we are doing the placement of our implants, our CBCTs are helping us in diagnosing exactly the amount of bone and quantifying the bone in terms of the width and the height. And that will help us in understanding, picking up the choice of the diameter and choice of the length of the implant which have been placed. And even after going and placing it, everything looks good. But what is going to be the design of the final processes? Do we really know about it? Now let's look at this clinical scenario. If I want to place a screw retained processes in the anterior zone, I'm going to see that there's going to be an access hole on top, which is an aesthetic disaster. Okay, But retrievability is very good. I can easily retrieve it. But if I'm going to put a cementable, beautiful looking process with a zirconia abutment and all, what if, if this abutment becomes loose in future and now the tooth process becomes mobile? The implant is not mobile, but the process is mobile. Then the entire thing goes for a toss because now that I have to approach the open up or remove this, I will have to destroy the entire prosthesis in order to access that particular inside prosthetic screw to tighten the particular uh, pro uh, prosthetic component. So when to do a cementable, when to do a screw taint? Let's assume a posterior. In a posterior, if I'm going to do a cementable, a beautiful cementable crown, um, if I'm going to use a fixed cement, uh, that is a glass ionomer cement to go ahead and cement it. I'm going to see challenges basically of uh, um, uh, excess of excess cement within the peri-implant tissue area, which is basically going to cause uh, loads of uh, peri-implantitis in future. And uh, if the abutments become loose, the retrievability becomes a question. Going through the entire bulk of the restoration to access is going to be a nightmare in the patient's mouth. But if I look, choose for doing a progressive cementation, that is basically using a temporary cement to fix it, and then depending, uh, retrievability becomes easier, but then the, uh, the process may become decemented frequently. Okay, let, uh, if I want, if I gonna change it into a screw retained process in the posterior also, the cost factors will go high. And of course, we are not, we don't have variable cost factors for our patients. Uh, we usually charge a fixed amount of uh, uh, prosthetic, a fixed amount of, uh, um, you know, finances when it comes to either an posterior or an anterior, or, uh, A, B, or C implant. We do not plan these type of things when we are trying to uh, 
convince our patient to take an implant as a treatment of option. So these are the dilemmas which we as general dentists itself face while we are trying to prosthetically rehabilitate the patient. So there are problems and there are solutions for it. And when we find the solutions, that's when we reach the uh, success in terms of that. So where do we actually start all this? We need to, uh, that is the prosthetic planning should be as we have a very famous quote that always think the end in mind before you start. And as implant dentistry is prosthetically driven, the first important thing we should be looking forward at is at the start of our diagnosis and treatment planning itself, what are the teeth we are trying to replace? What is our restorative space within which we are confined to work within? And by doing some uh, uh, called diagnostic mounting, diagnostic mockups, we are able to understand that in the end, what is the final type of prosthesis we should be looking forward to give? Basically, it's something like when we are trying to uh, build a building, the first thing that comes to, um, the first thing which is designed is basically the blueprint and the architectural design of what would be the final uh, uh, building, how it's gonna look. Taking that into mind, then the civil works will start. And implant placements is all about the civil work. The rest of the uh, plus, uh, the rest of the work is basically the prosthetic work. So that should depend. That should be on. That should be decided way before at the prosthetic part, uh, at the diagnostic work by doing a diagnostic mockup, which we usually do not do for our patients, thinking that okay, the prosthetic is going to come later. We'll decide at that point of time. We'll do this. We'll do that. Uh, thing right now. The first thing we should do is place of the implant and you know get the financial. Uh, benefits out of that and later we will think about how we need to plan the prosthetic so um, a lot of times uh, uh, the challenge does not come at the time of the implant placement the challenges come when we are trying to replace uh, we're trying to prosthetically rehabilitate the patient so having said that uh, keeping the end in mind uh, once we finish the phase one of implant treatment that would be placement of the dental implants the phase two of the implant treatment is about developing the peri-implant tissue. For that, the, what we require is something called as a healing abutment. Now, this healing abutment placement is, you know, is taken very lightly. It has been taken up by us. We do not really put emphasis on this thinking. That is just basically we are trying to get the communication of the platform to the oral cavity uh, by creating a nice gingival collar around. But this development of the peri-implant tissue holds the, success, holds the key, or at least an interim key for the final success of not only the restoration, but the long-term success also depends upon because this is the peri-implant tissue, which is going to preserve the bone, for, crestal bone for us and thereby making sure that the process is going to last for a very long time. So healing abutments, they, are, uh, they can be prefabricated healing abutments. Mostly we, that is what we use. They come in various sizes and various diameters. Their heights are different. The heights are interchange uh, uh, of various heights are present. Um, these heights, which we have to decide for placement in the, from the patient's mouth, depends upon the amount of soft tissues which we have between the implant um, platform and the outer thing. That is the thickness of the soft tissue will help us in decide what should be the basic diameter of the implant or basically what should be the basic height of the implant to be placed. And um, the diameter depends upon which tooth we are trying to replace and what is the mesodistal space we have between the two adjacent teeth when we are uh, in order to you know create that good emergence profile and create the soft tissue uh, profile around the implant area. Having said that, we also has customized because not every tooth has a, a has a um, called cylindrical round shape. Okay, uh, uh, every tooth has a different uh, cross sectional shape. So there are customable abutments also present, which are prefabricated, or temporary abutments can be used to customize. Uh, uh, to be customized in order with the help of uh, composite material in order to create that particular profile for the patient. Like in this particular photograph, you can see that we usually have more of a, um, a triangular shaped uh, cross section of the tooth. But if you're placing a round shape peeling abutment, we will only get a round uh, collared uh, gingival tissue. 
but if we customize the temporary abutment and do a composite build up at the time of the second second phase we can develop this uh, uh, soft tissue and mold it into the shape which we want which is desired for us with the help of these uh, uh, temporary abutments thereby uh, creating a good emergence profile getting a good aesthetic profile and basically having good uh, peri implant tissue so once we create this soft uh, this particular soft tube we can record it and help in developing and help in building up the uh, ceramic also on the uh, so as to get this particular uh, soft tissue profile it's a complex way of doing i can like uh, with the limited time i cannot go in detail about how we do that but yes it is possible we can do that but in general if we see what commonly we do in our clinical practice in order to in the second stage is two things we need to do one is we do not reopen the entire flap to reapproach the particular implant we only make a small pin hole incision a pin hole approach or a pin hole incision or a or a, a head shaped incision only in the area where we have uh, uh, placed the implant just to reach the cover screw region of that particular tube why is because if we try to open up the flap we are basically opening up a flap we are tearing the periosteal lining thereby uh, causing a little more about or more bone resorption in that region so at the crystal level second is we may lose the soft tissues when we are trying to do this so very important is this keratinized soft, soft tissue should be preserved in order to have a good peri implant tissue region so a small incision is made of course with the help of after crystal uh, local and uh, infiltration after that the cover screw is been uh, is located and removed Uh, once the cover screw is removed then the healing abutment is screwed inside it's a non engaging in nature so it is screwed inside and just left over there uh, of, uh, after at least 10 to 15 days of leaving it we see that the soft tissue has nicely formed around it because the uh, healing abutment is a polished surface so it does not form a proper uh, a hemidesposomal attachment it forms uh, a soft tissue uh, secondary uh, healing along the particular uh, um um smooth surface of the uh, healing abutment thereby forming this particular gingival collar once this is done now we are uh, we have the implant prosthetic platform exposed to the oral cavity which is basically the platform on which we should start our prosthetic part so the phase 3 of the implant prosthetic or uh, the implant or uh, the phase 3 of the implant procedure that is the prosthetic phase now starts so if we go back a little when the day we place the implants 3 months after placement of the implants let us assume that we are trying to replace a single molar in the lower jaw 3 months after the placement of the implant we are going ahead and doing the phase 2 of the uh, phase 2 of the implant procedure that is healing abutment placement we wait for 10 days for this healing abutment to nicely for, uh, form the soft tissue collar and then we are moving towards the prosthetic phase of the procedure during the prosthetic phase what are we trying to do over here we are basically now trying to prepare the final prosthesis to be delivered so for that the first thing we need to do is make an impression or a model because in the lab it is these are all indirect restorations so these are going to be fabricated inside the lab, in the lab so lab needs a model of your mouth or the oral cavity to prepare the final processes so what is our objective we, the objective is uh, to replicate the oral cavity as a model for a lab and to fabricate the final process so what but what are the benefits of our impressions or we can say what is the objective of our impression itself to make we are basically trying to record the position or a three dimensional position of the implant we are trying to record the depth of the implant the axis or the angulations of the uh, of the platform and also record the rotation of the hex position of uh, but uh, along with that the soft tissue contour or the emergence profile is also recorded with our impression so keeping these in mind uh, impression needs to be made for the implants and implant impressions are a little different from the normal crown and bridge impressions which we do in our day to day practice 
there are two types of impressions which usually are done one is the abutment level impressions which have a direct technique or an indirect technique and the second one is the implant level impressions where the um, uh, the uh, the implant prosthetic platform is directly engaged to uh, uh, in within the impression technique to do the to create the final model and most commonly the technique which are used are either closed tray impression technique or open tray impression technique what do we need for this impressions we basically need a, a stock uh, a stock metallic tray or you can use a custom tray also uh, the material of choice for us will have to be um, polyvinyl siloxane impression materials that is basic silicon impression materials your normal alginates cannot do the job you need the, uh, the silicon impression materials only you need certain components called as impression copings uh, and lab analogs and a little bit of uh, pattern resin uh, to do these uh, to make these impressions what is the impression material of choice as i said it's polyvinyl siloxane and polyether as our best material of choice for doing it why because they have very less bone toxicity they are very stable and uh, they are uh, they are available in multiple viscosities and they are because they rigidly uh, record the uh, record the position of the implant so it's uh, the models which are generated from them are very uh, uh, the uh, are very accurate as compared to your other hydrocolloid impression materials in our practice the best material of choice is polyvinyl siloxane that also you should it should be addition silicon and not condensation silicon mind you what we are trying to record over here as compared to natural teeth impressions is that in natural teeth impressions whatever process we make we tend to slightly modify the abutment tooth or tend to modify the prosthesis and then finally sit the pro, uh, make the process fit perfectly in the mouth that type of uh, small errors can be corrected but when it comes to implant impression you cannot do minor corrections in the patient's mouth if your prosthesis is not fitting correctly you on passively perfectly fitting into the abutment channels then you cannot finish the work you need to remake impressions you need to send the work back and get the entire processes refabricated so they are very technique sensitive up to the level of 0.5 mm of uh, precision is what is required when you are doing these uh, impressions so polyvinyl siloxane addition silicon is the best material of choice other than that your polyether also is considered as a very good material because it's a very rigid material it's a monophase concept so basically it uh, the same material can be used as a putty uh, can be used as a heavy body and the same material can be used as a light body but it is a uh, little cumbersome to make and second is because it is very rigid so if it goes and uh, blocks into the undercut areas that is anatomical undercuts is very difficult to retrieve the impression that's why the most commonly used materials polyvinyl siloxane what do we require for making impressions we require impression copings impression copings are nothing but these are components which will be engaging or will be going and fixing into the platform of the implant which has been placed and that will help us in recording the three dimensional position of the implant body within our impression and once the uh, impression is made these impression copings are then fixed to these lab analogs lab analog is nothing but a replica of the implant except that it does not look like an implant but it has the it, it has the platform which is present which is been mimicked inside this lab analog and this goes inside the model it becomes a part of the model so it's basically an implant replica except that the implant replica is basically it's used in the model for the uh, fabrication of the prosthesis so there are two types of impression copings depending on the two types of impression techniques one is called as the fixture pickup impression coping also called as the open tray impression coping the second one is called as a transfer impression coping also also called as a closed tray impression coping by default every company have their own basic designs in doing in making this impression coping so company decides its designs but all of them are focused on uh, engaging these impression copings within the impression material so that they do not become uh, they don't become mobile inside and they do not have any rotational uh, they have these anti rotational features to prevent any type of distortion when either when we are transferring the impression copings into the into the impression uh, they are made or when we are transferring and we are making um, pouring the model so they, having said in mind there are these are the two types of uh, 
uh, impression copings which are available. When you talk about the impression types, as I said, we have an abutment level impression where an abutment is fixed onto the implant directly. And with the help of uh, imp uh, plastic copings, we are taking the impression. And in the model, in the final and in the model, we are basically preparing the processes like a simple crown and bridge, which we use for tooth retained uh, cr uh, crown and bridge work and bringing back and cementing in the patient's mouth. So it's a very simple method of doing it. But the problem is that we don't get a perfect fit we also cannot be used when we have uh, implants which are not perfectly parallel to each other or if the abutments need uh, some amount of modifications in order to get the correct path of insertion and the correct path of uh, retrievability so in the uh, so not much used nowadays but previously this was uh, uh, this was uh, being used as a method of making impressions what is nowadays which is used very popular are these fixture level impressions which are nothing but closed tray and open tray in the open tray, when we place the impression coping and engage it into the uh, into the platform of the implant, you see these wide, uh, these long the screws which are placed. These long screws are made are kept long so that when the tray is placed inside with the impression material, these screws will be projecting outwards. So these trays can be custom made or can be uh, stock trays. Except then the stock tray or the custom tray, you have to make a window. For getting the, for jetting these particular screws outside. So when the impression is made for uh, when the impression is made with the help of putty light body, that is a single staged impression. These projections will be outside, and then with the help of a driver, we are going to unscrew them and then remove it together. That means the impression which comes out is going to hold these impression copings within the impression when they are out. On these, the lab analogs are placed and the uh, model is poured. When we talk about the transfer type of impression uh, system, we are basically placing these projections in the patient's mouth. But after we make the impressions, these projections will still remain in the mouth. They will not be a part of the impression. They will not come out with the impression. They will remain inside the patient's mouth fixed. We will physically remove them out and then uh, uh, according to the shape in which it is there, they, are makes, they make grooves and indents in the impression material. And then physically we will go and place them or insert them within the impression. So there is a small margin of error that can occur with these type of technique, but uh, both of them are the basic methods of using. So if you see in the open tray concept, if you see this photograph, you can see that multiple implants are placed. These project, these uh, impression copings are placed into, are engaging, have engaged into the implant. Then we are splinting them and using the resin pattern to make sure that they are all splinted properly. The reason of we are using resin pattern is because the amount of polymerization shrinkage is absolutely zero, so uh, very less. Thereby, they do not distort, so they remain in that physical position uh, and, they, and not move. So, and not get distorted. After that, the impression material is poured and then with the help of the st uh, a stock tray or a custom tray, these screws are opened up and we can remove the impression. But when we are removing it, the entire system comes out along with the impression. That's called as open tray. In the closed tray, when we make the impression, this impression coping is removed, attached to the lab and a log over here. And this entire system is now engaged into the impression material physically with our hand. Once we, we can see in the photograph over here, impression is made after the impression, the healing outcomes plays back, but then the lab and log is connected to the impression post with the help of a screwdriver. And then this impression post is inserted within according to the grooves that it has made within the impression, thereby going to the next level of pouring the cast. When we, uh, which type of impression material to be used where? But if you go through a lot of literature in the system, some of the literature says that the splinted approach, when you're using multiple implants, the splinted approach is the best method that is by using open tray impression coping, uh, impression technique. In some, they say that uh, the closed tray is better than the open tray. Um, in some of the uh, uh, researches, they say that both of them have, have, uh, uh, have do not have, uh, um, uh, a significant difference between each other. So they basically are the same thing. You can use any one of them. But um, if you go on uh, taking a meta-analysis of all this, it is very clear that when you are trying to replace um, multiple teeth, 
and when you're doing full mouth rehabilitation procedures at that at that point using an open tray concept is much much more better and much more accurate as compared to closed tray when we are using uh, single imp uh, single implant replacements then your closed tray will do the perfect job you really do not require open trays to uh, make such impressions mind you the open tray is a very cumbersome process and when we are using it when pa in patients which have uh, implants placed very deep in the second molar area and limited mouth opening your open trays uh, become a nightmare to do uh, to do it so they, of course you would uh, want to use uh, closed tray technique in those conditions having said that once the impressions are made and the um, um, the models are poured now comes is the choice or the selection of your final abutment then when you're talking about the final abutment every abutment i can be either most of the abutments are prefabricated you also have custom fabricated concepts but every abutment has certain uh, um, uh, uh, concept based uh, certain concepts that is basically the abutment height the abutment diameter the crown margin uh then the implant abutment junction or gingival height junction all these are present for us to decide which type of an abutment which is important for us for that particular case now this is the place where we feel that we do not have much knowledge and this is the place where we are dependent on our labs to decide for us what abutment to be placed and what to be is usually the uh, when we send to the lab the lab is going to call us and tell us doctor we need this particular abutment please uh, uh, provide it to us and we call back the companies and the company say we i need a stock abutment a straight abutment as the lab has asked for it and we do we do not talk about what should be the gingival height what should be the diameter of the abutment these are the things which uh, this information we do not provide to our pro to our lab person or we do not extract this information from our lab person and provide it to the our companies Be because at this point if we uh, we do not use correct abutments then our final prosthetics will really uh, have a different you know it will completely change we are not going to see uh, what we actually visualized so what are the specifications or in the selection process first of all we need to understand which fixture platform it is whether it is a mini platform or regular that means uh, which about which implant has been used and what are the specification of the implant platform that has to be specified second we need to tell whether we are using it for a single crown or we using for bridges whether we that is basically require whether a hexed abutment or a non hexed i will come to this concept called as hex abutment non hexed in the future slides uh the third point is what is the meso distal and the buccal lingual area of the replacement or the prosthetic space we have and that will help that why we need to know that because that will help us in deciding what should be the diameter of the abutment we are using mind you the diameter of the abutment need not be the same diameter of the implant which has been placed in the patient's mouth for example we must have placed a 4.5 diameter implant a uh, millimeter uh, diameter implant but it does not require because if we are placing a molar we have to replace a 10 millimeter space pro, uh, a crown it does not mean that we are going to place a 4.5 diameter uh, uh, abutment only the abutment needs to be much much more bigger because we need to compensate the space and that we'll i'll show you in the next slide the third point uh, the fourth point is the gingival height or the margin position because we are all running behind the margin of the prosthesis the abutment and the soft tissue so what should be the fixture depth or the margin position or the gingival height which should be taken into consideration when we are selecting abutment here the selection of your gingival uh, collar or you can say the healing abutment will really help us in understanding what should be the gingival height and secondly in our model the soft tissue profile which has been recorded will help us also deciding what should be the gingival margin of course uh, the crown margin can be modified up uh, can be modified to bring it a little below subgingival or little uh, supra gingival in order to uh, while doing the preparation of the abutment in the lab but approximately this is very important then the final is the height of or the occlusal height which we have for the restorative height which helps us decide what should be the abutment height if we have to replace uh, if we have an occlusal height of around 11 mm we are not going to provide a 5 mm uh, 
uh, or a four millimeter uh, height uh, abutment because when we put the crown and then we're going to see frequent decementations because of that so such type of uh, specifications are very important these specifications which we talk about is something which we need to discuss with our lab technician before we order it from the company and get it delivered for the lab to do the best possible prosthesis and deliver to us it's like basically we uh, our lab guy is the artist and we need to provide a canvas so canvas has to be of a very perfect size and shape there then only the final painting is going to come out appreciatedly so i have said that abutments can be prefabricated and can be customized in prefabricated you have temporary materials like acrylic peak and titanium uh, in pre, uh, we also have materials like zirconia and titanium abutments used for single restorative things and we have multi unit restorative abutments like multi units present or uh, uni abutments or basically prefabricated we call them as stock abutments and the second one is the custom abutments which are cad cam generated abutments or castable plastic abutments this is a picture depicting the various types of abutments which are available by various uh, all, almost every second company which is renowned is able to provide such type of uh, variety of abutments to us so the next time when we would go and decide which implant company we want to Uh, use in our clinics we should also focus on not just the design of the uh, implant or how good the implant is or how successful the implant is but also what is the prosthetic catalog which the uh, which the company can uh, provide us when we are doing the prosthetic rehabilitation a small guide tip which is uh, which i was talking about in terms of the diameter during the specifications uh, communication is about the type of uh, uh, abutment or the size of the abutments which you use so this is a very nice defective uh, uh, photograph which shows these are the natural teeth on one side and their approximate diameters or the mesodistal widths they have uh, uh, less um, without the soft uh, without the contours uh that is the uh, height of without uh, excluding the height of contours and accordingly the corresponding you can see when the implants are placed what should be corresponding uh, diameters which we should use to get a very good emergence profile for example when we are placing a molar we should be uh, most of the times we are basically saying okay uh we have placed a 5 mm diameter implant so let's buy a 5 mm diameter uh, abutment or a stock abutment just send any stock abutment and give it to the lab and lab fabricates we never focus on what should be the diameter the diameter over here plays a very crucial role in doing it so in the molars it should be preferably anywhere between 6 to 7 diameter dia in the anterior it should be anywhere between in the lower anterior away between 4 to 4.5 in the upper anterior approximately 5 you but these are all Arbit, uh, arbitrarily designed or arbitrarily uh, mentioned uh, the actual diameter would uh, would always depend upon every clinical scenario which we are trying to rehabilitate what is the significance here you can see if you have on the on the left hand side you can see over here as the arrow is depicting uh, is showing here that if for example i have placed a 4.5 diameter and if i use an abutment of 4.5 what happens is our prosthesis is something which you going to get fabricated on either side it is that is not changing the size will not differ but if you see from that the lower end the amount of the bulk of the restoration which will be there making the process more heavy the emergence profile may not be as good as we wanted and the peri implant tissue may not be as really what which we really look forward to uh, rehabilitate over here because the bulk of the restoration and the cantilevers will be more it will be more like a lollipop effect which we call in implant dentistry when we are using the wrong abutment diameters when we are using the right abutment diameters trying to we are able to create a better emergence profile a better soft tissue architecture and at the same time we are reducing the amount of cantilever which we are uh, which is in unknowingly or knowingly created while rehabilitating such prosthesis and these prosthesis will be definitely lighter in weight because the bulk of the restoration will be lesser as compared to where we are using the lesser diameter so where the diameter is less we are it is compensated by the prosthesis thickness where the diameter is more the prosthesis will be little lesser as compared uh, to keep that you know perfect balance between them 
Coming on to different types of abutments we have, which I have spoken before. We have rigid abutments, which are not really used nowadays. It was previously used where you used to do, place these rigid abutments directly, engage them in the patients, in the uh, implants, and then do a crown and bridge work, simple crown and bridge work. Nowadays, we have the two-piece systems, which are called as transfer abutments, which are nothing but abutment with a prosthetic screw to engage these prosthetic direct uh, into the implant. The same... Prefabricated standard straight abutment can also be angulated up to 17 to uh, uh, 17 to 23 degrees. We have 11 degrees. We have different companies have given, but maximum up to 24 degrees is what any company would be providing in these particular abutments. These angle abutments are usually placed in areas, for example, the upper maxillary anteriors where the, uh, the bone itself is angulated. So the implant would definitely be at an angle as compared to the cross section of the, or the long axis of the tooth, which was replaced or uh, also in the premolars also. So what happens is when these implants are placed at an angle, um, which we create in around 15 degrees, we'll see that prosthetically the access hole is coming outwards. It is not in the right channel. These angled, uh, if we use torque abutments to modi and modify them, we would hardly have good amount of surface area left over to restore it. So angled abutments by not decreasing the surface area will help us in correcting these angles for us. And because they are uh, present as torque, we can use them. So mostly these angled abutments are used in the maxillary anteriors and to an extent sometimes in the uh, to the premolar and the canine and the premolars of the upper, ante upper anteriors, upper maxillary zone. Uh, we, the same uh, abutments, which are metal, now can be even zirconia, uh, zirconia based. So we can have zirconia angled abutments, which are because, uh, of course, they are used in the anterior zone and we want aesthetic abutments to be used. The same thing. The second time of the customizable are the milled abutments, where the, the design of the, abut the abutment is being uh, uh, fabricated depending upon the area which it is uh, used for replacing. And it will look like it will be designed in the form of a prepared tooth, such that when this abutment is placed in the patient's mouth, we can go ahead and either do a build up on this directly and make it into a screw shape, or we can place this abutment in the patient's mouth and then put a cementable crown on these. So these are called as milled abutments. They are CAT CAM generated abutments directly from the company or from third party so, uh, systems. The advantage is that, that they have a better contouring, they have a better finish line uh, produ uh, production, uh, that is reproduction. And because the CAD CAM fabricated, they are much more perfect to fit in as compared to stock abutments, which need to be, uh, uh, which need to be again modified by preparing in the, uh, preparing either in the patient's mouth, if you're using abutment level impressions or in the lab by the lab technician. So uh, when we're trying to do a, a perfect final anterior aesthetic restoration, these uh, uh, smart fit abutments or milled abutments really play a very crucial role over here. Other than that, another type of customer abutments are these NP cast or castable abutments, also called as UCL abutments. These are plastic abutments, which are specifically used for making screw retained processes. We'll talk about it in the future slides. These, uh, these abutments are plastic nature. They are going to be casted after a wax up done on them in order to get the desired shape of the final abutment which we require. They can become one piece or they can be two piece. It depends upon what type of plan we have in mind. So castile abutments. The castile abutments and milled are the same except that in milling we are basically doing it cat cam. In castile we are doing the casting to produce the same. Multi-units. I've used the con uh, these multi-unit abutments I've used in the crown bridge work Usually they are used or maximum times they are basically used for full mouth restorations in all on four concepts and all on six concepts where we are using angle placement of the implants and then correcting. They are also called as uh, correction abutments or angle correction abutments. But when, uh, when and also act as uh, stress, uh, uh, de-stressors for us, these multi-units are also sometimes used for crown bridge work. Specifically nowadays, when we have found uh, when the options of treatment are based and when we don't want to do bone grafting or when we want to do um, uh, when we want to use pterygoid implants or zygomatic implants and we're trying to replace a section of the uh, uh, edentulous areas and we're using atypical implants or we're using highly angled implants um, above 23 degrees of the angle, these multi-units will help us in correcting the 
angulation first and thereby creating a correct path of insertion for us because what happens over here is these multi units will correct the approach of the or the uh, access hole for us thereby giving us a better approach to the uh, to uh, unscrewing unscrewing that is a path of insertion and retrieval becomes easier for us as you see in this x-ray you have a pterygoid implant which is at an extreme angle of more than 30 degrees and by using a multi-unit the process can be fabricated because if we do not use a multi-unit over here to correct then we can never get a favorable path of insertion as they are at an extreme different angles position in the beginning of uh, during our talk about abutments, we spoke about hex versus non-hexed. What are this? So this concept means that when these abutments are engaging into the platform of the implant, the implant has a, a hex or a non-rotational grooves present within inside, and these will correspondingly male component go and fit into the female part of that and act as 30 degree non uh, engage uh, non-engaging uh, concept. So uh, sorry, in, it goes and engages into the hex, thereby prevent and making into a non-rotational feature added to the system. So when we are trying to replace single teeth and or, or multiple teeth where we have parallel placement of the implants or ideally placed implants, then these hexed abutments can be used. But what if the implants are not positioned uh, in a correct angle? There is slight angulations. So to create a correct path of insertion or, an, or a favorable path of insertion and removal and having a passive fit, a non-engaging non concept is used. Here, in, if you see in the photograph, the engaging will have the a male hex, which is going to go and fit into the uh, female component inside the implant. But if you see um, the non-hex, it does not have that. So it passively just goes and fits onto the superficial portion of the implant, uh, implant prosthetic platform. And over here, the uh, how this particular uh, abutment is fixed to the implant is with the help of the prosthetic screw alone. Whereas over here, there is a frictional fit between the implant and the, uh, and the abutment. And of course, correspondingly, a prosthetic screw can be used. So if you see in this lower photograph A, this is a uh, custom milled abutments which have been fabricated. You'll see two abutments next to each other. They are basically similar. They look absolutely similar. There's no difference except that one has a hex and the other one does not have that particular hex which engages. Both of them will go and fit perfectly into the uh, into the implant. Uh, into the implant, there will be no distortion here. There will be no difference except that the second one is not going to engage the. Uh, the female hex component over here, thereby there is no anti-rotational feature for this particular component. So when we are trying to replace single teeth, never use non-hex apartments. But when we are trying to do bridge work, we are never going to get perfect parallel implants. So these non-hex abutments can be used to get that perfect path of insertion and removal. And when we are joining them or splinting these abutments together, that anti-rotational factor already gets incorporated, thereby gives the processes easy retrievability in future and easy cementability. So this is basically a concept. Uh, of excuse me, uh, sorry to interrupt again. Uh, yes. Shahul, how many more slides? Uh, we have another um, five, uh, five, five slides. Sir. Okay, because- I'm 64, uh, okay. I'm okay. at uh, another five slides. Okay, okay. thank you. I, have, I, have, I just finished 15 minutes. I have another five minutes to go, sorry. Uh, yeah, five minutes to go. So uh, when hex abutments and non-hexed are used, uh, up to 10 to 15 degrees of uh, interference, up to 11 degrees, yes, you can use. But what if the implants are placed beyond that particular angle at that particular position, that is the path of insertion, if the path is beyond 22 degrees, always look for, for convertible abutments or multi-units to get it back into the correct path of insertion and easy retrievability. The uh, one point other is about the fit and misfit. So when are, when are we using all these components, we are pacing the patient's mouth, into the implant and then removing it and we are transferring it to the uh, we are transferring to a model from the model we are transferring back to the patient there's always a chances of fit and misfit so using of iops and rvgs to reconfirm at every step is very important 
look at this particular rvg uh, x ray you can see from the start of the implant placement itself you should be very careful that about the placement of whether the cover screw has properly gone inside or not because if an interference is at this particular point itself if the cover screw is not going in you are not going to look at in future even the process is particularly going in similarly at the time of the healing abutment placement also is the same thing if you find an interference as any point of time by taking these x rays and you see automatically you are already seeing that the final processes will not be so it's important for us to correct the interference and then move forward when you're doing a transfer of the imp or using impression copings or making most of the times we place the impression coping and we think that oh it is perfectly fitting it is tight so we record it but if we record it in our if we don't perfectly fit and recheck confirm in our x ray sometimes if we see this much amount of error that is up to 0.5 to 1 mm error over here correspondingly in the model it will there will be an error correspondingly a processes will be uh, having an error it will never perfectly fit we will blame everyone else but our particular techniques which we have used to replicate the model to uh, to get the final processes for the failure of it and we keep on repeating the processes we keep on trying to change not realizing where we went wrong so at every step whatever component you are introducing in the patient's mouth an x ray should be taken to reconfirm and check whether it's perfectly fitting or not because it is blind we do not see what's happening at the plastic platform so x rays are the only method in which we can be able to understand whether we are right on track or not the la even while placing the abutments also the same thing sometimes we place the abutment and we don't know whether we are actually placing the abutment correctly or not and we'll think that okay the process is not fitting there is occlusal errors are present but actually the process did not fit that is why we are seeing an occlusal height or occlusal error and we are trying to correct that not understanding that if the model in the model if there is no occlusal error there should be no occlusal error in the patient's mouth and if it is there please go back and check whether your abutments are fitting perfectly or a process is, is perfectly radiographically fitting correctly or not and last but not the least we spoke about screw and cement retain processes so a screw retain process is basically when the abutment and the prosthesis the cap is one piece that means it is basically the abutment and the uh, the abutment itself is the cap or the crown it is one piece it is going and directly engaging into the into the uh, into the implant and with the help of a screw that is a prosthetic screw it is getting tightened as a one piece system these screw retain processes are very favor uh, costly to fabricate because they have to be casted or milled and uh, once uh, second is that these uh, advantages with this is that they uh, can be used where you have very less interclusal space present or in places where approachability is very difficult and in multiple implant placements where you have where you want a favorable path of insertion removal these uh, screw retain processes are very good to be used the second one is the cementable type which is very commonly used over here the abutment is placed separately in the patient's mouth and uh, finally torque and on top of that the particular cement is a uh, cement is used to screw uh, to a uh, 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 cement is used as a barrier uh, which is placed between uh, the crown within the crown and the abutment and the cement is the retentive component over here to hold the crown on the abutment now when we using uh, natural uh, for na the same cements for natural teeth the retrievability becomes a problem over here because fixed cements can uh, are used second is that the cement can overflow from the margins and into the peri cemental area or sorry peri implant area thereby causing peri implant titers on a longer run so we should look forward to avoid these type of cementable crowns uh, they are easy they are cheaper to fabricate but then retrievability becomes a problem second is peri cement peri implant areas we have excess of cement which if not cleaned properly we would lead at uh, peri implant titers but nowadays very commonly we are using combination that means a screw cum cement retained it is nothing but the same cement retained prosthesis except that now it has a hole to approach the abutment from from the top so it mimics like a screw retained but it's typically a two piece system which is been placed in the patient's mouth and over here the type of cement used is a fixed cement that is a, a, a glass ionomer cement or a resin based cement which is used for fixing it so how we do it is basically we put the abutment in the patient's mouth and tighten it final tightening block the particular hole over here check the interproximal contacts of the crown and then use a cement to cement this particular crown inside then as a one piece you can retrieve it back clean up the entire cement area of uh, around the peri implant area as well as around the uh, 
uh, around the abutment and uh, crown junction. And then like a one piece, you can put it back in the patient's mouth. Sometimes the labs will directly do this and send it to you for your convenience. So this is called as a combination, which is the most commonly system uh, com a combination of uh, screw retained or a combination of screw retained and cement retained, which is used in our day-to-day -day practice nowadays. That comes to the end of my presentation. Time for some discussions. Dr. Nair. Thank you so much, Dr. Shahul. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, Dr. Fahad has uh, locked out for some time as he has a case. So uh, you will have to take up the questions. Or if any other uh, mentors could answer our questions, that would be great. OK, the first question to you, Dr. Uh, Shahul, is from Dr. Naya Fadus, uh, who asked that, uh, is there any type or method of implant to be uh, placed? Uh, does it influence the choice of graft to be used? Uh, most successful combination of gra graft implant, if any? Um, well, the question is uh, not from the perspective of prosthetic rehab. It's per se from the surgical perspective. Uh, we're talking about uh, as if the question, if that's the, if that's the way I'm understanding is that, is there a favorable implant um, a surface for graft materials? That's the question, if I'm not wrong. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Can you hear us, Dr. Shahul? Yes, yes. So basically, um, implants which are hydroxyapide co coated and implants which have uh, um, the surfaces are hydrophilic in nature, um, they are, uh, they have better, uh, uh, what do you call, capacity, they have a better understanding or you can say a better integration when it comes to graft versus the implant surface because uh, when they are hydrophilic in nature, uh, they are able to better adapt and have a better contact, uh, uh, contact angle created between the blood and the, thing, and the implant surface, thereby increasing the, uh, the osteointegration levels. But having said that, uh, not really, um, every company comes up and says that uh, there are two types of services. There's the SLA surface and the RPM surface. And they both say that, you know, we are having a better contact compatibility in terms of grafting solutions. But more than that, what's important is when you have active implants as compared to the uh, standard implants, the active implants are able to better adapt themselves to the uh, graft materials as compared to the uh, normal shaped implants. Okay. Um, active implants means where the thread design is very sharp. So what happens is when we compress the bone graft into, for example, in an indirect sinus lift area, where the bone graft has been packed into the, uh, within the sinus uh, uh, tent, which we have created, uh, when we pack the bone graft, this particular, uh, we under prepare the osteotomy site and we place the uh, implant of a bigger size such that it uh, will go and bite the bone, which we call as the, it bites the bone more better and creating a better primary stability, not only creating a better fan, but also a better uh, adaptation to the, uh, the graft material as well as to the natural bone, which it's trying to adapt it. Okay. Uh, there's another question from Dr. Arshia who asked that. Uh, Hello, I can't hear you, madam. Hello, I can't, I can't hear you, madam. Dental implants still recommended when modern improvements like bone crafting and dental implant designs are available. Uh, we are now. sorry, uh, I think you need to repeat the question because uh, your audio was. Yeah, 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 we yeah, can yeah, hear you. Okay, okay. There's a question from Dr. Arshia. Are subperiosteal dental implants still recommended when modern improvements like bone grafting and dental implant designs now, are available? This, uh, in fact, subperiosteal dental implants, um, uh, uh, they have now they have come back into the market or you can say they have now become coming back and used by a lot of maxillofacial surgeons. I see a lot of cases being posted about that, especially something by Dr. Abdul, Mahid, uh, Abdul Hamid, if I'm not wrong, where his, the concept of subperiosteal implants are used. They are basically used where you have deficient uh, bone, you really 
really do not have uh, the opportunity to do a bone grafting, a successful bone grafting. So in those conditions, in especially in full mouth cases and partially edentulous cases or cases where you have had resections and you have uh, some malignancies being removed and there is a good amount of deficient bone present. So we don't have the opportunity to regrow the bone graft with the help of bone grafts with both black as well as particulate. These subperiosteal implants can really uh, do the need because they basically go and fit like plates or, oste uh, or as osteofixative concept. They fit over the, uh, the bone and then we can load them with the help of our prosthesis. Uh, to the, yeah. See, from the prosthetic perspective, as long as we have a good um, support system, uh, the type of process can be designed, uh, but whether they uh, whether the process, uh, whether the implants are osteo integrated or osteo fixated is a question which is always going to be uh, a debatable one. Uh, see, ma'am, uh, what happens is uh, in um, a deficient in posterior maxilla due to an extreme amount of uh, pneumatization of the bone, there is hardly any bone left to go ahead and do. Uh, um, place the implants. There is a deficiency not only from the perspective of the height of the bone, but also from the width of the bone. Um, so in such conditions, and if the patient does not uh, accept any type of artificial bone grafting to be done and redeveloping the particular bone, then the only alternative treatments which will be left for us is use of pterygoid implants, basically going and engaging the pterygoid bone, which is behind the third molar region into the pterygoid space. Uh, which is again uh, a cortical bone or using the zygomatic bone uh, complex to go ahead and place the implants. So zygomatic implants are nothing, uh, are basically these long implants which are going to be going and engaging osteofixated. Of course, they also have the concept of osteointegration, but they basically go and fix into the zygomatic bone and they are directly bought, uh, uh, the projection is brought into the oral cavity just at the point where we are able to rehabilitate with the help of multi-units and the prosthesis. So zygomatic implants are using basically zygomatic bone as the anchorage for their implants. Okay. Uh, Dr. Neha um, asks us the question that, uh, does the use of surgical implant guide have a better outcome of implant supported prosthesis? Absolutely. There is no second thought about it because the surgical guide is going to be fabricated or constructed depending upon the, it is uh, because uh, on the basis of the type of uh, uh, basis of the final prosthesis or the, uh, the final crown or bridge, which is going to be already designed. So after the CBCT is given, the software is going to first design the crown, which is going to be placed over there. According to that particular crown or the prosthesis, it will design which is the, uh, it will calculate the amount of bone and the angulation of bone and design the upper, uh, approach through which we can go ahead and place the particular in, uh, implant into the bone. So yes, surgical guides, both, uh, both uh, made, by, uh, made by us uh, manually in, uh, on the models, as well as the ones which are made by uh, digitally fabricating them using CBCT models. Yes, they definitely help us in understanding the final outcome and thereby having a better prosthetic uh, thing. Uh, you know, outcome. Okay. So my question for you, uh, could you please uh, share some uh, knowledge about screw retrieval when the implant, uh, the abutment screw breaks? <laughs> <laughs> madam, you asked me the most dreadful question which comes in front of the implantologist. <laughs> see, yeah. madam, there, see, there are two ways in which screw retrieval. So first of all, um, two parts I would like to tell it. I'll take this uh, two minutes to say that because yeah. just from the past two weeks, I've been at least three cases where I have spent almost three hours trying to retrieve the screw uh, yeah, exactly. in consultation practice and we, we don't even get paid for it much. So what yeah. happens is there are there, some of the companies have got called as screw retrievable uh, kits present with them where what they basically do is the screw gets broken at the junction uh, when first of all, they, when third party screws are used for for prosthetic uh, for the prosthetic crown and bridge second is when they have not been perfectly fit and too much of uh, offload uh, pressure has been applied offset uh, loads have been applied thereby fracturing the uh, the, uh, the screw so what happens the screw gets fractured just below the neck so what uh, this uh, so a part is inside the pros uh, inside the uh, platform of the implant and the part is in the prosthesis. So now to retrieve it, Vlad, there are uh, what these uh, companies come up with is basically they want they you, they create a channel through which 
uh, they uh, will drill a small hole through the particular screw and then you can untorque it with the uh, untorque it they have their systems second is if you don't have any like this then you have to basically uh, rely on your uh, scalers to slightly uh, make the particular screw mobile it takes at least an hour and a half to slowly try to without damaging the surface slowly try to unscrew the broken uh, broken part of the component and remove and if they are cold welded then okay. god save us yes <laughs> okay and uh, worst is worst is if they are placed in the second molar area of the upper maxilla and the patient has has a limited mouth opening or they are basically put a pterygoid they put a pterygoid implant where it is again in the third molar region there is no approachability and screw is designed it's better we just leave it there bury the implant right bury the implant <laughs> Okay. No, no. We also get uh, universal retrieval kits for yeah. The, the retrieval retrieval kits are there, yeah. but uh, if you don't have any of these tools, uh, then God so save you can us. always try uh, creating a groove and then using the regular screwdriver. <laughs> yes, he can. Uh, the thing is, it should be it should be approachable. Uh, yeah, most yeah, of the yeah, cases access, which we access have, is access important. important. Most of the time, we see retrievability issues is not in the anterior but in the posterior and second molar area where the offset is more and the uh, process fracture would be the highest. i think it's not just about the access i think it's about the visibility as well ha visibility of course yes sir yeah uh, so dr humaid suleiman wants to know the concept of multi unit abutments see multi units are also called as angled abutments or oh, sorry or uh, multi, uh, angle correction abutments they are not angled abutments they are angle correction abutments there are two parts of this cardiac concept multi units have been developed with an intention in mind that when you do an all on four and you purposely give an angle to your implants thereby you get a better stress distribution you do not have the straight path of insertion to create and second is your platforms are at the implant level so these multi units not only they correct the angle of retrievability and placement of the processes but they also bring the platform uh, to the Uh, to the gingival level or the or the uh, outside in the oral cavity level they bring the platform down it's basically trying to convert an internal hex into an external hex so what these multi units will do is once we place the multi unit and if an, if the implant has been put at an angle of 30 degrees may say so the multi unit 30 degree will make it will will be positioned in such a way that now the angle is corrected back to 0 degree or parallel to the adjacent implants point number 1 point number 2 when you place the prosthesis the prosthesis now is engaging the multi unit rather than the directly to the uh, directly into the implant prosthetic platform thereby the stress is getting dissipated or distributed at that multi unit junction so whatever fractures you'll see whatever you see is at this <coughs> junction not at the implant uh, level and therefore the crestal bone loss also is being free so when you talk about cronen bridge work multi units are, are very ideally used when you have a deeply submerged implant and you're not able to bring the, you're not able to access the platform easily these multi units will bring will not only correct the a uh, position but they uh, are uh, angle but they also bring the platform towards the uh, occlusal surface that is or the gingival surface yeah uh, dr shahul if i can interrupt can you stop screen, uh, screen sharing and uh, dr fahad has joined us so he can join the panel as well uh, with all your videos on dr usma fahad and shahul then we can continue the question session hello yeah you can just uh, stop uh, screen sharing and then we can take dr fahad also. Stop share. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Doctor Usma. Yes. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Doctor Salman yeah. Basha has a question. He asks: Can fixed prosthesis using uh, natural teeth and an implant as an abutment? What's your opinion? Absolutely no. Absolutely no. There is a very simple thing. See, abutments. Uh, see, natural teeth are um, having. Uh, uh, they have a periodontal ligament around them. They have up to two hundred to two hundred fifty microns of uh, movement present. But implants are basically ankylosed inside the bone. So using uh, implant as an abutment and another abutment as a natural together to replace are uh, is basically one of the weak link is going to basically do. You're going to lose one of the weak link. So either you lose the tooth. or you will uh, tooth abutment or you will lose the implant abutment or some sort of a failure may occur at long at, a, at after a couple of months or years but there are a lot of researches which have been done which are trying to prove say that yes we can use uh, we can support the tooth and the implant together i guess they just been lucky but, but what we see in the clinical practices so you know many patients when they get referred to us you see many of these egyptian and you know uh Outside India, you know, basically in the Middle East, 
you'll see a lot of implants connected with the national growth. Many people do it, but it is not recommended. As you rightly said, uh, the the micro movement, you know, when it's, you see the nature of the implant and the nature of the of the national growth is completely different. The implant, five to ten microns, is the movement. Whereas the national growth, as you said, more than two hundred fifty microns, uh, the movement is there. So when you do the functional uh, loading. One thing is rigid, one thing is moving. It, the prognosis is that either the implant's osteointegration will fail or there will be technical failure with the prosthesis. Or with the prosthesis. I'd like to also add one more point is that, uh, you know, when you, when you talk, we, we need to talk with evidence-based with the patients. So uh, there's a study by, I think, Jedrison, 2015, 2018, systematic review. He says that when you, when you combine an implant with a fixed uh, implant and a national tool, uh, 10 years down the line, 17% to 20% is a failure comparison to 95% of uh, the survival rate of an implant, uh, of a conventional implant. So th those things have to be in our mind. In fact, I would add, add a point over here that let us assume a clinical a feature, a clinical condition where we are basically replacing a single molar uh, in a 3-6 region. So what we usually do is after finishing the entire torquing and we finish the cementation, everything together, we place uh, articulating paper and ask the patient to bite. And then uh, we'll see, check the high points and finish. One thing which we fail that patient comes back within two or three days and say, doctor, I still feel when I'm chewing, my implant will be a little more, uh, will show up a little, uh, uh, like I still feel a high point on my implant rather than on my natural teeth. Sometimes patients say, the problem is you, no one went wrong anyway. It's basically when the patient is trying to chew, when the patient, uh, the teeth have that little bit of compressibility, but uh, the implant will not have the compressibility. So what happens is when the patient is trying to chew, if there is even a slightest amount of uh, high point, that will be projected as a bigger. So uh, when we are replacing these, um, uh, what do you say, a single uh, tooth or a bridge, uh, we need to make sure that when we are correcting the occlusion and we are doing selective grinding, it has to be, um, first of all, at, when you're, at, by doing dynamic movements and checking for that. Second is, uh, if the, the high point needs to be a little more corrected as compared to when we are doing it with a natural tooth to compensate that. Uh, in case of implants, right? Slightly. Slightly more. Okay. Okay, so uh, could you please uh, tell me the difference between immediate loading and uh, early loading? What's the difference? I know okay, it's like, you know, you have to for uh, immediate loading, it's within 48 hours. Immediate loading mm -hmm. ke baad aap ghar ja kar aap pareshan ki, uh, ki kya within, within 10 days would the patient come back and say that, you know, my implants have failed and early loading may probably ek mahine ke baad. Okay. Uh, jokes apart, what is important is immediate loading is when you have achieved a good amount of torque that is ideally above 50 newtons of uh, torque in your primary placement. And it is, and you are directly preparing a prosthesis. Uh, for the patient and then using the prosthesis and bring into functional capacity. It is called as immediate loading. Okay, we're usually using them when we are splinting the implants together in full mouth, full mouth cases, uh, where we are using a temporary processes, maybe it can be a final, it can be a temporary processes, but we are going to uh, load the implant directly. Now, the point is that uh, from primary stability, the implant will move into secondary stability, but because it is at torque at 50 to 60 Newtons. So when in that particular arch, the, uh, when it is transferring from primary stability, the torque value slightly decreases, but because they're splinted together, the forces are nicely dissipated and we, and, uh, we don't have to wait for the entire Austrian integration process to wait. Early loading on the other hand is after a week and within one month of placement of the implant, you're trying to uh, load the particular uh, prosthesis. I think in both the both the systems, in both the yeah. and this, in the early loading cases, uh, there's something called micro movement that occurs within the implant. Uh, Dr. Fahad, I think sorry to interrupt you. Your audio yeah. is uh, very feeble. Okay. Now is it fine? Yeah, I, I think it's okay. I think because you were uh, you were leaning back and then sitting, I think uh, your audio yeah, is yeah. not getting. That's right. I'm not using the uh, the microphone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. So what I was saying was in both. Uh, early and immediate loading, we have to uh, consider a, a concept called as uh, micro movement that occurs within the beneath, you know, uh, between the osteoid integrated implant and the tissues. So any amount of occlusion loading is not tolerable. It's not uh, desirable. So we try to uh, 
you know we try to put the 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 processes outside of occlusion and if it's a if it's an anterior case if we go ahead with the immediate and early loading we try to give a, a, a provisional restoration which is again a not a in occlusion but it is just for the purpose of uh, two things one thing is aesthetics and the second thing is we are trying to create the we are trying to mold the process to the soft tissue Okay, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Arshia Khalid has a question. How to salvage a failing dental implant? Remove it. <laughs> we feel the implant is failing. Uh, we need to first, uh, okay, on serious note, um, there is a, there's a concept called as ailing implant. There's a concept of failing implant. Now, where the borderline is, really don't know. But then, if you see considerable amount of bone loss occurring, but still, uh, and a lot of peri-implant tissue, uh, uh, what we call inflammation or peri-implantitis is present, then the best way would be that, first of all, you deload the implant, that is remove the prosthesis, open up the flap, nicely curettage the particular area. Uh, after you curettage, if you have that if only a one wall defect or two wall defect, you can graft it, wait for the uh, wait. Of course, it is not going to osteointegrate. Definitely a re -outed integration is not what we are seeing. We are looking at it only as a camouflage or you can say as a scalloped uh, bulk added to the system. Once uh, uh, which uh, once the graft is picked, taken up, then you can go ahead and go back to uh, reload the implant. But finding out the reason why the implant at the first instant was losing its bone, that would be a prosthetic failure, uh, offset load, which is extensively being put on that particular implant. That needs to be also corrected and taken into consideration because then that particular um, the further uh, uh, what, uh, uh, process needs to be seized at that point. But if you see that more than two thirds of the implant is already gone, it would be better you remove it probably place a new implant back in the zone after the bone has been rehabilitated. But if you see only one third of the implant is being, then we still have the two third of the implant still present inside the bone. It would be good at this juncture to, you know, bring that to the patient's notice, remove the processes, put the healing out in bad, open up the entire soft tissue, re-clean that entire area, disinfect it nicely, and then go ahead. There's a full protocol about that from the periodontist perspective. But you're not going to see re integration on that particular surface re again. So you rather open. Any more questions from the audience? No more questions? Actually, I had a question for Dr. Fahad and in fact- uh, Dr. Practice. Fahad, yes, um, do you have any experience with uh, the uh, abutment locators? Abutment locators, yes. Uh, you know, when we are considering uh, over dentures, you know, I think, uh, mashallah, a nice presentation by uh, Dr. Shahul. If some of the things uh, we could have added was uh, locators uh, in, you know the over dentures so regarding the locators it's it's the uh, it's an abutment that we use basically for an over denture it's one of uh, the one of the advantages of a locator is that you know it occupies very less interdental space interocular space so that is you know i think that, that can have a that we, we can have a different uh, altogether presentation you know over dentures and not supported over interest like that. Yeah, I had actually had the slide there, but then I had to remove because it was not concentrated in that particular. Does it have any cushioning effect uh, in terms of dissipating the bite forces? Well, sir, first of all, the uh, concept of locator abutments is basically from the retentive perspective. It's an adjuvant to your denture which you are placing. It's not really going to be taking up the entire load of the process of the uh, or taking up the entire stress. Yes, locator abutments, uh, the advantage of locator abutments over those ball and socket abutments is that the ply is less and uh, you are able to use it even if you do not have uh, perfectly uh, parallel placed abutments to uh, parallel placed implants. These locator attachments can be used and uh, they just will add up to the retentive capa capability or the stability uh, and the stability of the final denture, mandibular denture, rather than actually taking up the entire stresses and looking like a fixed process. Okay. And uh, one more question to Dr. Fahad. I, I, I get to see a lot of patients here with uh, you know, cantilever pontex with uh, supported implants. I, I, I really don't understand the concept here. I think maybe this is all because the Egyptian dentists or who get to do it. But then I don't know if you've come across this kind of uh, patients. Yes, I get to see a lot, lot of, of patients. A lot um, of teeth and as well as uh, 
implants with a cantilever you know the cantilever in, politics yes the cantilever processes yes but eventually uh, the patient comes up in 2 3 years and you know either the implant is failing or the abutment has failed so, so again talk- you know when when do we when use uh, cantilever yes right dr shaw you you want to add that yeah i think we would want to use cantilevers <laughs> only if you are using it for trying to keep the cantilever as measly as possible not distally point number 1 point number 2 when you are if you have uh, implants for example if you have a missing canine to the last molar and you have placed three implants so you can have the ca- the canine in the cantilever position okay uh, pr- provided that now the canine is not going to be your cornerstone you're not going to have a canine protected occlusion you will have a mutually protected occlusion so uh, yes you can have a cantilever with implants the only thing is it should be a part of a bridge not a part of a single so you can't use a single molar and try to replace molar and premolar that is absolutely not acceptable whether it's mesial or distal but if you are if you have two molars been replaced okay for some reason you did not put your implant in the premolar area you have placed your implants in the two molar region and now you have lost your premolar you can put a cantilever except that this particular premolar which is going to be now in the cantilever position needs uh, should not be as a part of the um, what do you say uh, into perfect contacts that is in the contact with the occlusal surface of the opposite toe you mean to say cantilever is an option if uh, yes cantilever for, is for an option because see for but functionally example, but functionally is not. really acceptable yeah now if you exa- if you take that uh, of my patient he lost a 6 and a 7 and we have placed two implants we put, we put a prosthesis for the patient and job done come patient comes back after 5 years and loses a 5 for some reason and now if we tell him that we want to place another implant if he says no can you use these two implants to uh, to put a cantilever and make a new prosthesis rather than making a new implant and new then yes it is possible except that it's not coming in the functional part that's it The, the premolar is cantilevered, but it's not functional. I think one more thing we can add is that uh, when you when you think about all on four or or, or all on six concept, some part of the processes is a cantilever. Of course, AP rule. Yes, the distal distal to the last implant. But uh, what we are we are we are, we are uh, planning it before, beforehand because the cantilever arm, the the distance of the cantilever arm and the liver uh, processes. we are uh, planning it before ahead, uh, beforehand so in that way the functionality is not uh, disturbed so when we are placing the when you place an in any implant for that matter and occlusally we are trying to rehabilitate as a part of implant protected occlusion your load or the contact point between the opposite pros, op, opposite tooth and the surface occlusal surface of the implant should be on the long axis or the area of the axis where uh, 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 long axis of the particular implant that is at the center of the implant it is not the way we usually do getting the three point contact and trying to rehabilitate the point of contact should be only at the central fossa or the point where the screw is getting tightened into below that is at the long axis of the implant uh, can i request dr fayas to uh, put across a point i he had just raised his hand a couple of minutes ago i'm so sorry dr usman oh, that's not a problem sir <laughs> yeah okay Dr. Fayas. Hello, Dr. Nair. Dr. Shah. Yeah, you me? had raised your hands, please. Evening, If you have want to put across something, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Good evening, sir. Yes, sir. Good evening, Dr. Shah. Very good presentation. You Thank gave you, sir. very good, uh, especially about type of abutments and a lot of prosthetic outflow. Oh. Can you hear me, guys? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Dr. Fayas. so uh, it was a very good presentation uh, i think what i uh, bit missed is about a bit of cementation procedure and uh, setting the occlusion uh, for uh, implants but uh, overall very good and lot of couple of points i want to raise uh, actually there are many things first thing what dr nair asked about the grafting and implant uh, regarding that i think both are different because grafting procedure is different and you know putting the implant is different what i one point i just want to make is it's like the osteotomy we prepare because once the grafted bone is always d3 so you have to have your osteotomy with a less you know uh, burrs which are more less destructive probably you can use uh, a tensa burrs or something like that which uh, you have osteo densification kind of techniques uh, i think those will help 
Uh, yes, some good surfaces will definitely help. Uh, regarding cantilever, we know that cantilever principle is one third of the total support of the, uh, you know, implants or the uh, total support we have. Again, antro spread, AP spread, all that different formulas are there for for large restorations. But when we consider two, three, 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 I think in the posterior teeth, I just want to make one quick point: is if you are giving a cantilever, especially in the posterior, probably for the aesthetics you can give, but never give occlusion on the cantilever pontic. Avoid giving occlusion, and only for the aesthetics you can do. And uh, one more question was asked about immediate loading versus progressive loading. Again, in immediate loading, there are two types, immediate loading with function and without function. So generally, we give immediate loading without function, only for the aesthetic reason, especially premolar onwards. So whenever we are considering immediate loading, always consider immediate loading without function, means without contact. Uh, you know, uh, full mouth rehab cases are different because we are going to give contacts all over the mouth. And uh, finally, regarding the setting the occlusion, always use your 30 micron articulating paper to give the clearance. If you have two opposing implants, use double articulating papers and make sure you give two, uh, you know, give a proper clearance of the whatever the 30 microns that natural teeth. Yes. And uh, these are the few points I think I wanted to make it. So, and finally, one question was that connecting the natural teeth and the implants in some conditions you can connect. I have published a paper in 2013, a literature, systematic uh, literature about the tooth implant connection. Uh, so, I think only very some conditions you can, if at all, if you're giving telescopic crowns onto the uh, you know implants, which will give you a bit of movement, which can add, add a uh, you know add a stress breakers there. So these are a couple of few points I wanted to make. I think uh, otherwise uh, I, you guys have done excellent presentation and covering all the questions. Thank you, Dr. You can carry on. Dr. Fayaz, thank you for the great knowledge. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Fahad has uh, left for the clinic and thank you, Dr. Fahad, for your uh, contribution. Uh, there was a question from uh, Dr. Salman Basia. He asked you, how many pontics can be placed between two implants maximum? All depends. It all basically depends upon which area we are trying to replace. If you're replacing in the anterior zone, then you can place two implants, one in the canine to canine and, and, and put four pontics between them. Okay. But if you are the same thing, if you're trying to go in the posterior zone, uh, you can't, uh, it becomes uh, the, the, the longer the bridge is, the more the number of pontic, the failure, that is the amount of stress will be more. And of course, uh, more than one pontic, I would nef definitely would avoid in the posterior region. Uh, there's a question from Numan. Uh, natural teeth have PDN for proprioception. What about implants? There is no proprioception in implants. That's one that is the biggest drawback of dental implants. You, If you have, uh, if you're chewing, as Dr. Fayaz sir was mentioning, that if uh, if you have two, if you have an opposite implant and you have and uh, a lower implant and upper implant, two teeth are occluding over each other. You keep a nut between them and you break a metal nut. Uh, they will use the entire force to try to break that. You will not be able to feel it. It's so usually in crown bridge work, you'll have opposing teeth will be natural. So that would help you in getting that proprioception. But as such. Implants do not have any proprioception. You're not going to feel it. That's one thing we always uh, tell our patients which are in full mouth cases that after finishing the full mouth rehabilitation, the patients are put on night guards because patients do not know how much amount of force they're going to generate when they're going to chew because they'll have implants on top, they'll have implants below. So how much amount of force they're generating while chewing, it's completely going to be a question mark. So yeah, because there's no proprioception there. Any more questions? Dr. Uh, yeah. Hello? Yes, Dr. Fayaz, please go ahead. I just want to ask you two lateral, uh, four incisors are missing in the front. Uh, I, just, I just saw a case where two implants were placed on the lateral incisors. Uh, and uh, I think coordinate FPD was planned. Uh, oh, uh, I think uh, we all have gone through AID classes. Yes, so. yes. I was, I was laughing about that. that Natalie Wong's classes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I remember Dr. Ayatollah like it will give you a banana effect. What do you yes, think about it? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Um, there are a couple of scenarios, clinical scenarios. If you have two centrals missing, uh, uh, sorry, you have all the four teeth missing, that is two centrals and two laterals are missing. Placement of an implant in the two laterals and creating a prosthesis versus uh, placing, an impl uh, placing two implants in one central and lateral and then putting a cantilever on the other side. Various concepts, various things are there, uh, mm -hmm. but the best would be to place in the central incisal area. Two centers and give cantilever to laterals. Yeah. But uh, provide, see, all this is on the basis of designing on the basis of the bone present for us. Now, if uh, usually in the in the lateral uh, in the laterals uh, where, where the laterals are present, the bone will be very thin. It will be highly concave, and uh, uh, the uh, the the size of the implants going to be placed in will be very thin. They're not going to be the normal ones. So, as compared to the centrals, of course, we're going to have. But if you have a nice block area, a good ridge, then it's always good to place. I think, sir, I think you were present during that thing, uh, during the case. There's a case from Delhi, Dr. Shankar Iyer, I was treating, where he did a block grafting in the anterior zone yeah. and uh, he developed the entire site, the, uh, the entire site, because both in the centrals as well as the lateral area, there was a deficient bone. So he used block graft, developed in six months, then placed the implants on either side and prevented the cantilever. Yeah. So, and, uh, uh, Dr. I think we missed about the digital outflow. Yeah, we had to cut. We had to cut down about digital implants and because the number of things was yes, yes. the digital implant, the digital abutments or the CAT cam impressions. Okay, Doctor okay. Sahil, uh, uh, Doctor Humaid Suleiman has a question. Uh, how do we calculate the buccolingual uh, dimension of the ridge so that we get to decide the size of the implants? How to calculate the buccolingual dimensions? Can I say? Okay. King uh, about, uh, yeah, the bone to decide the, to decide uh, decide about the size of the implant. Okay. About the bone mapping. So yeah, when you, at the diagnostic stage, especially when you do the pre prosthetics, so you actually do fabricate a tooth, then you are going to decide the size of the implant. So according to the tooth, and you are going to decide the size of the position of the implant, and when you get into a lower portion of the soft tissue and the bone, that's where you have to do something called bone mapping. There are two methods. One is called cast-based method, one is digital method uh, to assess the buccolingual width. In the cast-based method, what we do is we take a, a OPG and we put a ball bearing and uh, we are going to take a OPG with a small ball bearing in the mouth by fabricating a radiographic stent. And we are going to calculate uh, you know, the height of the bone with the magnification error. And we do something called bone mapping and you just put a surface anesthesia and with a stopper what we use in the endo, we just put it on the crest of the, uh, you know, uh, edentulous area and three millimeters below the crest, buccal lingual and six millimeter below the crest. And we measure the thickness of the soft tissue and same thing we measure on the cast, on the diagnostic cast what we have. So we add the soft tissue thickness and, you know, uh, subtract the soft tissue thickness from the width of the uh, measurement what we got on the cast. So we get a width of the bone there. Otherwise, simple technique is nowadays to just make a CBCT. They'll give all the values, buccolingual width, how much is there at the crest below the three millimeters below the crest and six millimeter. That will definitely help you to know the width of the implant. Again, measure distally, how much span of edentulous space is there that you can calculate on the diagnostic cast and that you will get it. We know that there is a formula where one, two, three, five, I mean, at least one millimeter should be away from the front tooth or one to 1.5 millimeter should be away from the front tooth. So if you're placing four millimeter implant, at least you should have a space of seven millimeter for mesial distal width. And also buccolingually, you should have at least seven millimeter, six to seven millimeters of bone uh, if you want to place a four millimeter implant. That's how we calculate, I think. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Asma Jaha has a question. She asks that uh, if two centrals in the mandible are missing and bone is mesiodistally less to place two implants, can we do cantilever for the other two centrals? Hello? Yes. Uh, Hello? If the two centrals are missing in the mandible, 
and if the bone is measured is really less than less for the two implants to be placed in that means on one implant you have to design the process in such a way that when the emergence comes it come basically it looks like two teeth but it's actually getting supported by only one implant in the center uh, well it's a tricky case to a, tr a tricky case to do you can do it but because it's only in the mandibular central area you can do but that particular two centrals which you are trying to design and do it would be basically dummy teeth not into function then it feels okay but uh, such a case where you have a compromised bone mesodistally also not i would prefer uh, looking forward for doing a simple crown and bridge work rather than doing uh, implant uh, retain two centrals because on long term i want survivability is important for us so i would prefer not doing an implant in that region Uh, I would rather uh, do uh, uh, simple crown and bridge work and give uh, probably a good zirconia prosthesis for that matter, and replace the region, yeah. but That's not place an implant. Uh, such cases is definitely not implant cases. That's uh, being a prosthodontist. It's a, a very good case for the medulla and bridge because generally those conditions will have lateral incisors also slightly mobile. or a little periodontally compromised when there is a bone loss we do get a lot of cases where anterior teeth are mobile where one or two teeth teeth have been lost but uh, i think never to attempt implantology for such teeth because still periodontally compromised adjacent teeth will be there i think uh, a maryland bridge will stabilize the other teeth also and uh, it will provide a lot of support i think maryland bridge is ideal treatment for such cases but uh, what happens is uh, fiaser in um, like i have done a case like this i have done a case i have done where uh, the implant is not been done by me it's been done by a surgeon and uh, they have called me for a consult to do the prosthetic part and uh, this is a point where uh, you have to do the processes because you know uh, the prosthetic work has to be done uh, because the doctor has to is uh, requesting has requested you and you are been working for them and uh, at this point trying to change the entire prosthetic plan, uh, system itself that like, let's do a maryland or let's do a, a crown bridge work rather than doing when the implant is already placed and also integrated at this point uh, what would be our uh, uh, you know decision making say no i'm not doing it go ask a surgeon to do it uh, who's placed the implant or you know go ahead and do it but you know tell the patient you know let the patient know that these are the problems you're going to face in or let at least the doctor know that this is going to this i'm bring i'm this is what is going to be the compromise part of this what should be our point because i did it i'll be yeah. i'll be candid about it i had to do it because you know you are young you are you you accept the case because you've been told because if you decide to refuse the case you don't know whether you'll get a new case again. so I did it but then i made sure that uh, it was out of occlusion it was not a part of the it was just like uh, you know hathi ke dant hain jo dikhane ke dikhane ke hain khane ke nahi types i think we have dr hilal also in the panel i can see him he's a senior professor so i think he can also uh, give his opinion about this kind of compromised cases yes so he's hearing dr hilal if you could share your knowledge with us Doctor Osma, do we have any more questions? Ah, uh, yes, sir. Ah, uh, Doctor uh, Shabina Begum, she wants to know about anti-flow in implant. How would you? Doctor <coughs> Shaul. Doctor Shaul. Doctor Shaul, can you hear us? Now, the audio is disconnected. Your speaker is not working, Shahul. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Huh? Yes, uh, the Dr. question. Dr. Shabina Begum wants to know about how you apply anti-slaw in implant. How do we apply anti-slaw? Anti-slaw. Basically, her question is anti-slaw. See, anti-slaw <clears throat> is purely from the purpose of uh, tooth retained uh, prosthesis. 
of course it's a very simple area should be uh, uh, the very simple area of the abutment should be more than the uh, very simple area of the uh, tooth which we are replacing when it comes to dental implants uh, to an extent uh, it has applied similarly but there is no anti's law for uh, uh, at, le at least for my knowledge that there is no anti's law for uh, implants per se but when we are trying to replace three missing tooth uh, we are basically trying to uh, replace by placing the implants on either side of the prosthesis either side of the edentulous side and then putting a prosthesis which is like a three unit prosthesis except to avoid the cantilever and making sure that the buccolinguli the occlusal table is less and the uh, and the occlusal contacts are exactly on the long axis of the implants not on the pontex anti slot doesn't take occlusion into consideration so it is no more valid uh, even on occlusal table I have a question, Shahul. Shoot, sir. Uh, these days, everybody is uh, professing about you know follow the bone concept while installation of the implants. How does following the bone concept influence or govern the prosthetic uh, placement? It's prosthetic nightmare to replace when we are following the bone. If you're gonna I, I place, I agree with you, but then I want your inputs on it. <laughs> so the inputs, uh, see, uh, the thing is. Uh, when we are placing uh, the prosthesis, because that's the final thing which is going to be there in the patient. I mean, do you do you it. agree with the follow the bone concept? No, no, I do not agree to follow the bone concept. I I still I agree with the concept that if you have to use dental implants as a treatment modality, it should be used to make sure that wherever you are placing the prosthesis. Then there itself the implant. That's the uh, after the design the process and then place the implants accordingly, with or without grafting, and because that is going to be there for the longer duration in terms of its prognostics as compared to wherever there is bone you place it. Because whenever we do that, we are always going to look forward for some or the other complications associated with uh, prosthetic uh, failures. But having said that. I'm quite fascinated with the pterygoid implant concept. I have not used it. I've only prosthetically rehabilitated it, uh, or cases of that in my practice. Uh, but I'm quite fascinated with the concept where you place a pterygoid implant at almost 35 to 60 degrees, uh, almost 45 to uh, 50 degrees in the pterygoid bone, and then one implant in the in the premolar area, which is again transsinus, and then you put multi units and replace them. It's easy to do it, and it's I'm pretty. Yeah. Uh, recently, I think there was a. Uh, uh, in, in Indore or Nagpur, somewhere, I think they did a pterygoid implant workshop wherein they claim that this is the safest uh, uh, yes. installation of implants because to avoid the sinus. This, doctor, is really, uh, this is really appalling and then very funny. Uh, so actually, I, I, I myself attended the course of pterygoid implants by Dr. Venkat Nag, the TTPLH concept. And uh, well, I was at the initial, I was not so sure about it. But then after five years, cases which have been there showing now, the recall visits or basically the follow-up of those fires cases. Uh, it looks fascinating to see. I don't know what is going on inside, but say as an outsider, yes, uh, the, there is. Uh, we don't. The concept looks very nice and fascinating. That you are uh, you are trying to bring osteofixation and osteointegration as a uh, as a concept, merging them together and using it. And you are uh, placing it in the pterygoid space, which is a pretty safe place to place according to. Uh, the anatomy which they say uh, and second is then rehabilitating using multi units because at the end of the day when you're using a multi unit automatically you're acting you're acting you're adding a stress uh, uh, you know a, a de-stressor there and then retrievability becomes easy and placement also becomes easy for the prosthesis and it is a good posterior maxilla non graph sorry graphless solution Kelly. thank you so much Audience. Okay, I think uh, if we do not have any more questions, uh, we should be ending the session for today. 
Yeah, please, Dr. Uda. Yeah. Uh, Alhamdulillah, it was a very good learning session uh, from all our mentors. So thank you very much, Dr. Shahul, Dr. Fahad, Dr. Fayaz, and uh, all the other uh, presentees. Uh, thank you for uh, taking your time out from your uh, busy schedules. Uh, all the uh, attendees, all the uh, people who are present, thank you so much. And uh, Global uh, Dental Professionals, I thank you a lot for giving us this platform to learn. It's been a great experience for all of us. Uh, we get we get to learn a lot of new knowledge from you all, and uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Goodbye.